All right, this morning, turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to begin with verse 11 this morning. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Now, as you know, when the word therefore is used in Scripture, really in any other place, uh, it's like a door that swings backward and forward. And so it's swinging backward to what the Apostle Paul has already been saying, and then it's swinging forward to what he's about to say. And so what he's already been saying is that the Lord is coming again, and uh, he's been writing about that. The followers of Christ should not be worried about those who have already died because the Lord's taking care of them, and they are with him. They're present with the Lord. And when he does come again, he will bring them with him. And second, they need not be anxious about when the Lord is coming, as they will discern the times and seasons. And finally, Paul wrote that whether living or asleep, believers would live together with the Lord. Uh, now, what does this mean? One of my ministry, and really pastor heroes in, in history, is a guy named, by the name of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who fervently promoted the church as a community of disciples under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, when he did that, he was competing with uh, Adolf Hitler, of course, who wanted to be Lord. Uh, and so Bonhoeffer wasn't very popular with Adolf Hitler because his Jesus, his Lord, was competing with him. And so, you know, there was a lot of angst over that. But Bonhoeffer was a great German pastor. He was martyred under the Nazi regime, and he described what it means to live together with the Lord. Now, he wrote this. He said, when God's Son took on flesh, he truly and bodily took on out of pure grace our being, our nature, ourselves. This was the eternal counsel of the triune God. Now we are in him. Where he is, there we are too, in the incarnation, on the cross, and in his resurrection. We belong to him because we are in him. That is what the script, why the scriptures call us the body of Christ. Body of Christ, the community of Christ, the church of Christ, all one and the same. Now, so while believers are together, what are they to do? The Apostle Paul says they are to comfort and edify one another. So as the door swings forward, the Apostle Paul goes on to describe how we are to do this. So the word for comfort comes from a Greek word that means to come alongside someone, to give assistance and encouragement to them, or even comfort. It carries the same emphasis as a support group would carry. For instance, consistent presence with people. How can you comfort other people if you're not with them? So we believe very strongly, and, and Paul believed this, and we believe that here, it's important for us to be present with one another in a variety of ways. It means to be uh, non-judgmental, that we're not in the business of judging people, condemning people, uh, critiquing everybody. Uh, you know, when people have uh, their uh, walk with God, you know, we're all at a different spot. We're developing that walk and, and uh, then willing to listen. Uh, confidentiality with one another and then praying for one another and then bearing of one another's burdens. And it means to cheer people on. All these things take place in a typical support group. Uh, and so those things are important in all of our lives as we get together with other believers to do those things. I see this happening a lot on Sundays after service, and it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I mean, it takes an hour for everybody to get out of here on Sundays, and I think that's great. I don't mind waiting for everybody to, to get out of here because I know there's really a lot of great uh, community going on. Uh, it happens uh, at the men's breakfast. Uh, yesterday, about 20 guys gathered together, and I don't know when I've ever been in a gathering of men where there was more community going on. I mean, we just had a glorious time. It kept me going the rest of the day. There was such refreshing in that. And we got even more connected than we'd ever been during that breakfast time, sharing our lives with one another, uh, talking about what it means to be meek. Uh, you know, the blessed are the meek, for they still inherit the earth. And, 
And then why is it hard for men to understand that it's okay for a man to be meek? <laughs> According to the definition that Jesus gave to meekness and the scripture gives to meekness. So that was a, a great time. There are Bible studies, there are home groups where community is happening. Uh, so where we gather together in any size group, we see that this comfort and edifying is going on with one another. The word edify means to build up. This recognizes that we are to assist one another in spiritual growth. Someone said that, that Paul here describes what it means for our church to be a true community uh, by doing this edification with one another. Bonhoeffer also wrote this. He said, he who looks upon his brother should know that he will be eternally united with him in Christ. Christian community means community in and through Jesus Christ. So the centrality of Christ, uh, you know, is getting with singing that song is our offertory today. You could just see that all through that song and all the songs that we sing today, the centrality of Jesus Christ. That's one of the things we firmly believe in, that when we gather, he's at the center of everything. You know, it's not the pastor, it's not church programs, it's not our facility, it's none of those things. It's him, it's Jesus. He's at the center of everything. And so it's in and through him that we're able to comfort and edify one another. It's Jesus Christ who holds the community together. Uh, it's not me. I don't hold this community together. I don't, you'd be thinking that I do, you know. If I weren't here, Jesus Christ still be here. You know, he'd be holding everything together, I can assure you. So put your attention on him, because if you put it on me, I'm probably going to disappoint you from time to time. Probably already have. <laughs> well, forgive me and forget about it, okay? <laughs> so anyways, Jesus will never disappoint you. Uh, so keep your attention on him. So, uh, you know, while we are in community and in Christ, we are under his direction and influence. So the only thing we can do if we are under his influence and direction and surrender to him, the only thing we can do is comfort and edify one another. We can't do anything else but that. So if, if something else is going on, you know, maybe we better get back to uh, the centrality of Jesus, okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at here. It's a true test, really, of how much we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, whether or not Jesus is at the center of everything, and we therefore are comforting one another and edifying one another in Him. Now, every community has individuals who provide leadership. In the local church, leadership is typically represented by pastors. Uh, Paul goes on to describe to be the believers there at Thessalonica how they should relate to the church leadership and the leadership to them. Luke mentioned two leaders by name in his writings, uh, Aristarchus and Segundus. I like that name, Segundus. You know, it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I may, might see one of our little uh, babies named Segundus someday around here. I don't know. I think I'd, I'd love to see that. Uh, that's a big thing, right? In churches, people are naming their children after biblical characters. Well, there's a good one right there, Segundus, pastor there in Thessalonica. So uh, the first exhortation here is he says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. So they labor among you, those who are in leadership, the pastors labor among you. And they, they study in order to teach and equip the believers in the word of God in equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, which was the mission that they've been given. You may also, uh, this may also mean taking advantage of the myriad of learning opportunities that are out there for pastors to work hard at growing and developing an understanding of God. They lead by example uh, in serving uh, they are not just encouraging others to serve, but they themselves are serving as well. Uh, and they're setting an example by that. They're even willing to do the small things or go the extra mile as an example. Jesus said that a great leader will humble himself and serve and be as a servant. Uh, and so uh, the apostles demonstrated this in the book of Acts. You might recall that there were European widows who were left in Jerusalem there as among the believers who had come to Christ on the day of Pentecost. And thereafter, thousands of people came to Christ. And, and so the church was, they didn't have any resources. So the church was needing to come alongside of them uh, and provide for them their meals and, and uh, their needs, for their needs to be met. 
And so the apostles were spending so much time, you know, uh, serving and all this that they recognized that they were neglecting some other areas of ministry. And so they chose six men uh, full of, their, uh, this was the first deacons, I guess you could say, in the church. They, they chose these men full of the Holy Spirit, of good reputation, and equipped to do this serving. Uh, and so, but, but they did it first. They didn't ask these guys to do something they hadn't already been doing, you know. And so, you know, a, a leader in the body of Christ is also out there leading the way in serving. Uh, this also means that they are accessible. Notice here he says that these guys are among you. Uh, they are with you. They're present with you. They're not inaccessible. You don't have to go through all kinds of traffic to get to the pastor, you know. You know, and it's, it's, I don't mind people calling me. I don't mind getting emails and text messages and all those kinds of things. And, I'll, I, you know, by saying that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to set myself up for a deluge of anything. But, but when people call me and they say, I hate to bother you, you know, you don't need to say that. It's okay for me to be, be called. And I'm not bothered, by the way. You know, pastors should be accessible to the congregation. Uh, and so they are among you. Second, you will know them because they are over you. Now, what this word means is that they are in front of you. It's hard not to so know somebody when they're constantly in front of you, right? You know, and uh, I can walk up here and everybody knows who I am, you know, because I'm in front of you as a pastor. So you know them because they are in front of you in the Lord. Uh, Paul does not explain what he means by the words in the Lord, but we know that he wrote what he wrote in Ephesians 4.11. It says, and he, Christ gave to some to be uh, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So these are those whom Christ has given to the body uh, to serve in primary leadership. But it's, it, on the local level, it's interesting, of all these gifts that Christ gave to the church, the pastor teacher really is the only one who stays in a community of believers. They're the only ones who are there day in, day out, week in, week out. You know, the others are pretty well, they were pretty well itinerant. They went from church to church, community to community. And so uh, this, this guy became known to the congregation, the fellowship that he was serving. Uh, so uh, recognizing them as being in the Lord would also be demonstrated by leading the way in love for the people, in patience with people, in kindness, in other-centeredness, and in humility, with a high sense of character and integrity. Those are all things that you would expect in a pastor of a local church fellowship, and they are an example of the nature of Jesus. Third, they will admonish you. Now, the word means to caution, correct, and gently reprove. We do this through the teaching of the Word. Sometimes when we teach the Word, the Word admonishes. Uh, and as that Word is given, you know, there's a stirring in someone's heart because there's something that needs to be changed. There needs to be some improvement made in a person's life. And so this is done through the teaching of the Word. Uh, we may do so in biblical counseling. Somebody comes in and they meet with a pastor. There's an admonishment also to the whole church fellowship from time to time about something specific, you know, uh, and then to individuals also. Uh, now, uh, for those who are in any leadership role, being in the Lord means that any admonishment is done in a biblical manner, in the gentleness of Christ, as the scripture says. It means the right time, uh, the right place, and the right tone should be considered when doing admonishment. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that's right admonishment done in the wrong way is not a good thing. Uh, so it produce, it does not produce a good result. Uh, and, but likely a wounded, perhaps even angry person would be the result. So admonishment needs to be done in the gentleness and the love and kindness of Christ. Otherwise, uh, that person who is in need of admonishment is going to uh, react negatively. Paul then tells the believers at Thessalonica to esteem very highly and love those in leadership for their work's sake. Uh, now, again, we see that those over us in the Lord are not discerned by their titles. You know, he doesn't really get into titles 
Uh, and I don't think titles are that big of a deal, to be honest with you, even today. Uh, and you know that you don't discern somebody by their title. A person can have the title of pastor, but not be a real pastor. You know, not do the work of a pastor. So he's saying that in a sense, you know, don't esteem somebody because they have that title. Esteem them because they actually are serving among you, and effectively serving among you. Uh, so their uh, titles are like a job description. Those who do not work are difficult to highly esteem. Um, there is a lot, this is a logical statement, and that would be true in your workplace, too. If you were to esteem somebody, a supervisor or manager, if they're not plugging in and, and serving as a, as a good manager or supervisor, then there's going to be hard to esteem that person uh, in the workplace. There are no perfect pastors who are gifted in every way or even able to meet everyone's expectations. But I did read, I did read in one of my favorite pastor journals called Leadership Journal, uh, about a model what a, that a model pastor had been found uh, and it's to suit everyone it's guaranteed that he will please all the people in any church uh, he preaches only 20 minutes but thoroughly expounds the word he condemns sin but never hurts anyone's feelings he works from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. doing every type of work from preaching in the pulpit to janitor work. He is 26 years old and has been preaching for 30 years. <laughs> he is tall, short, thin, heavyset, handsome, and has one brown eye and one blue eye. Has his hair is parted in the middle, left side dark and straight, right side blonde and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spend all of his time with older people. He makes 15 calls a day on church members, spends all of his time evangelizing the unchurched, and is never out of the office. That's a perfect pastor. A little laughter about that. Nevertheless, we understand Paul's point of view here. Uh, he, being esteemed in ministry is dependent on the quality of one's service to the church fellowship rather than some title. In a healthy church, a congregation esteems a pastor because the members of that church are learning from God's word uh, and are under and growing under the equipping from God's word and spiritual guidance is being given. Finally, Paul exhorts the people to be at peace among yourselves. So the word peace for peace means a sense of harmony and well-being. So how do we maintain peace among ourselves? Paul next gives a series of exhortations that will assist us in understanding what it means to maintain peace among ourselves. In verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. So note here that Paul writes these exhortations to the brethren, not to the pastors, but to the brethren, and that means he's writing to the church membership, okay? Those who are part of that church fellowship in Thessalonica. Uh, he says, warn those who are unruly. Now, the word for unruly seems to me, just simply means out of order, okay? So when you see a sign on a vending machine, an ATM or the misfortune of seeing a sign on the restroom door in a public place that it's out of order when you especially need it is pretty disconcerting, isn't it? Uh, they need to, you know, there's, it means that it, things are not working right when you see that sign somewhere. There are out of order signs with people as well. They may be expressing inappropriate anger. That's a sure sign that things are out of order. They may be caught up in criticism of others and cynicism or gossiping about others. They may be dropping out of worship and fellowship. Their spiritual health has clearly been interrupted and they are showing signs of being out of order. So the word for warn here is the same as the word for admonishment or admonish. It means to gently explore what is wrong and offer kind reproof and guidance. Biblical directions for this are given in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, that reproof is to be done in a confidential matter, one on one, first of all. Uh, and uh, it's to be done in private with all the facts being 
explored first of all before that reproof is done. If there is no response, then a second person with knowledge of the problem uh, will go to that situation with you. And if there's still no response, then it is brought to the church leadership. So, you know, my encouragement, and I've shared this with this congregation many times over, if you see a person who's out of order, what I would encourage you to do is, first of all, don't come to me about it unless it is affecting the church at large, okay? Go to that person yourself, first of all. That's what the scripture teaches. And so you can go to that person and you can begin the process of their restoration if you follow that biblical guidance that's in scripture. Uh, in Galatians 6, Paul wrote that reproof is to always be done by those who are spiritually mature and in the gentleness of Christ with restoration as the goal. Uh, one other word. This is, does not mean that we're called to go around like uh, church police to see who needs a ticket. When we are in loving relationships, it should be sufficient that those close to that person who's out of order uh, would be the first one to admonish them. When I hear of a situation like this, what I tend to do is call those I know are close to that person and, and ask them to reach out and help them to deal with what they're going through. So I, I see myself in a sense, and again, unless it's something that is affecting the whole church at large, I see myself as kind of the last resort to do this. But you guys are capable of doing this in the Lord. Remember, you're doing it in the Lord. What does that mean? You're going to be comforting and edifying when you do it because you're in Christ. One other word, never ever do these things by email or Facebook, especially Facebook or texting. None of these are ideal for admonishment. It is very difficult to discern the gentleness of Christ and the desire for restoration through these means. Uh, people will often feel defensive and interpret the words as unkind even if unkindness is not intended. These can be a shortcut to disaster. Confidentiality, confidentially go and speak to that individual after a season of prayer in person at the right time, right place, and with the right tone. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, a church fellowship is not like a business where the unruly get fired. Okay. Uh, it is like a body. When a part of my body is hurting, I don't get rid of it. Now, there are certain exceptions to that. If my appendix has exploded, well, I've got to get rid of it, you know. But, you know, uh, you, you seek healing for that part of your body and restoration for it. You know, uh, you know I, the local church is like a family, and a family seeks to restore an unruly member. And then number two, Paul is exhorting the, the congregants there at Thessalonica to comfort the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted are those who are overwhelmed by something stressful. They are those filled with anxiety over something. Uh, perhaps they are going through grief over the loss of a loved one or a divorce or a loss of a job or an illness or maybe they're even immobilized by depression. And these are the faint-hearted. The word faint-hearted literally means a season of emotional ineffectiveness. These people need someone to lean on while they recover their equilibrium. And it's kind of like that song. I won't go through the whole song, but that song, Lean On Me. We all need somebody to lean on. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on, for it won't be long till I'm going to need somebody to lean on, lean on me. So you see that reciprocal leaning thing going on here that is indicative of the, of the church being a community of people in Christ. This involves empathy, which is the ability to sense a person's private world as if it were your own, but without losing sight of the as if. Uh, it is the ability to encourage or experience the feelings of that other person is experiencing 
without losing your own sense of reality uh, as an ind a separate individual. Empathy is feeling another person's problems as if they are you, your own, but you're not letting them become your own. Does that make sense? You're feeling what they're feeling as if you're the person with the problem, but you're not taking on the problem for yourself. And so otherwise, what will happen is we'll wind up crippled by that problem as well, the stress of it. It's important to tell a person in crisis that we will are willing to keep what he or she says about their issues and struggles in confidence as well. Now, be, pay close attention to this. Uh, confidentiality includes what is spoken as well as your own impressions or observations about something. So it's, you know, those things are very important. However, people in crisis within a church environment, uh, what you can do, it just I'm trying to equip you with this a little bit, but if you go to that person and you let them lean on you and you're being uh, empathetic with them and you're trying to help them assist them, there may come a time when you can ask them, would you like for me to share this with the pastor or somebody else that you know is a spiritually mature individual? And if they say yes, then you can t either bring them to talk to the pastor or someone else or share that with the pastor to reach out to them and bring support. So that's kind of the pattern that you follow in doing this. The third thing is uphold the weak. In Paul's writings, those who are weak usually refers to those who are struggling with temptation or some life-controlling uh, life problem. And the way to support these individuals might be through Christian biblical counseling or the involvement in a support group somewhere. Uh, this would in also include those who are having a crisis of faith uh, Paul referred to people with a weak conscience uh, who are trapped in legalism, believing that they are not acceptable, acceptable to God because of some kind of extra-biblical uh, tradition or expectation or extra-biblical rules. And so there's a crisis of faith uh, when they see other believers who aren't following those traditions or rules that they're following, and so their conscience is bothering them. And they think your conscience ought to bother you as well. And so what do you do with that? A case in point is where, uh, you know, some of the Corinthian believers uh, were refusing to eat meat that had been offered to idols because they believed that they were ingesting demons if they did so. You know, they were not ingesting demons. It just so happened that that meat that had been offered to idols was the cheapest meat in the marketplace. And so those who couldn't afford to pay a lot of money for meat, that's what they bought, you know. And so there, there's nothing in the meat that would contaminate their souls or their spirits, you know. But, but there, those people happen to think that it would. And so you don't say to that person, you know what, how about going shopping with me and we'll grab some of that cheap meat down at the market, you know. Because their conscience would not go for that. And so we're sensitive to the conscience. He called it a weak conscience, the weak conscience of another person. Uh, in situations like that, we would cause them perhaps to stumble in other areas if we uh, violated their, their conscience. And then four, be patient with all. This is the same word as long-suffering in Paul's famous uh, uh, exhortation there about love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Our temptation is to negatively react too quickly to people when their lives are out, are, are out of order, or when they are faint-hearted or weak in faith. If we, do so, if we do so without being lovingly patient, then they may push us, push us away because we're being impatient. Part of comforting and edifying in the body of Christ is to be patient with people because they're not going to get it right overnight. It's going to take time. And so we work patiently with people. Uh, we would not want the person's last remembrance to be that some of us were not willing to suffer long with them. Uh, long suffering, however, is not an indulgent, codependent kind of thing with a person either. It speaks the truth and love to a person when they need to hear it. Uh, someone said, love never suffers merely for the sake of suffering. Love is not masochistic. It never puts up with things because it does not care much. Love is not indulgent. It does not suffer long because it is afraid to confront wrong. Love suffers long so that time 
and can be created for redemptive powers to be at work to do their work so that healing and reconciliation may be possible love suffers long so that suffering can finally cease so being patient with those uh, who are struggling in some way with life uh, is so important for us to to be that way in a community of believers uh, and so let's be patient see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone this is number five keeping in context it would seem that paul is especially concerned that peace be maintained by not being vindictive toward other people in a church fellowship who have wounded us or offended us in some way or treated us in an evil manner uh, and so this is an echo of what jesus taught on the sermon on the mount and what it means to walk on the narrow way that is difficult the broad way would be to have a vindictive attitude toward those who do us wrong. This is what Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, 38. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So the conclusion we've sadly come to, and I've been doing this for a long time. I've been in the ministry about 46 years. And I've seen a lot of things go on in church life over those years. Sadly, there are people who attend local churches who are hypocrites and act in an evil way toward other people. Because you and, I, you and I both know, don't we, that just because somebody goes to church that they're, doesn't mean that they're just an absolute perfect saint. They may not be a saint at all, you know. So Paul suffered a great deal from phony believers I remember as a young minister feeling shocked at some of the abuse that a few individuals rendered toward me. And most of the time, these guys were manipulators. They were people who had personality or character disorders. And somehow they had gotten a foothold uh, to where they could do harm to anybody who was the pastor of the church they were in. And that was almost like their goal in life was to bring the pastor down. And so I wanted to strike back. But you know, I didn't do it. I was constrained. I'm so glad that everything I've wanted to do, I didn't do, you know. <laughs> and that's one of them. So the Holy Spirit constrains us from that. Suppose someone slaps you, Jesus said. Uh, well, do not slap him or her back. Turn the other cheek as if to give the opportunity for another slap to happen. The slap that Jesus speaks of here is that when somebody insults you, or it does, and it's not an act of violence he's talking about. Here. He's saying that if somebody does you wrong, don't turn and do the same thing to them. Just stand in place and wait. And uh, so if someone insults you or speaks evil of you, do not do the same thing to them. If we do, we'll become like them. In Proverbs 9.8, I'm not going to recite the scripture, but it tells us not to reprove a scorner because it will only deepen their hatred. To reprove a scorner will lead to even more evil. So there's a time when we have to back off from those who are scorners or those who are acting in an evil way toward us. The word translated evil, by the way, in our text means a mode of thinking, feeling, or acting that is destructive and injurious toward others. Uh, and Paul wrote something similar in, in the book of Romans to what we've just read here. It's almost a duplicate except for verse 19. In verse, uh, Romans 12, 17, he says, repay no evil no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so this is an echo in Scripture. Jesus said it, Paul said it, and he said it again, and said by others as well in Scripture. So here we see that God, though, is a victim's advocate. He will fight our battles for us. You know, we don't have to go out and go to war with people. God will do it for us. Uh, and so he's a victim's advocate. He'll deal with those who do harm to others in, in his own time and in his own way. Vindication is God's business. It's not our business. That's not, not our job description, okay? It'll make you sick and tired and sleepless being vindictive. Uh, and you'll wind up looking like the bad guy instead of the, bad, the real bad guy, okay? Uh, so it's important to understand what he's saying here. When David was anointed king, the second king of Israel, the first king, Saul, 
became jealous and enraged and even homicidal toward him. Uh, he threw his spear at David on numerous occasions while David was playing his harp. Uh, David was real popular with the people. He was already anointed to be the next king. And, and, uh, but, uh, and, but Saul kept seeking to do harm to him time after time. David never threw back the spear, not one single time. He didn't say, throw that spear at me, I'll throw it back at you. I'm younger than you are too, and I can work you over too, pretty good too, dude. <laughs> you know, David never did that. Uh, he had a chance to do harm to Saul one day, and all of his men wanted him to, but he refused to do it because he left that to the Lord. Uh, David trusted God to take care of him and, to, and with the task of dealing with Saul. What the Lord hopes for, and what should be our hope as well, uh, is that those who do harm will be redeemed and become godly people. Jesus said we should pray for those who spitefully use us. And I'm going to tell you this. If somebody has spitefully used you, pray this prayer. God, I pray that this person would reach a point of repentance and become your child and become a godly person. I have prayed that about a number of people, and I've seen it happen. And it's the most amazing thing to see God change that person's life. So pray that prayer. That's what Jesus said to do, is to pray for them. Number six, always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. This is a reminder that none of us is an island, just doing our own thing. Whatever we do, whatever we say, and whatever is our attitude with others will affect the entire body. The way we do things and conduct ourselves needs to always keep in mind that each of us or whatever area of ministry we are involved in or with is part of a unified, interdependent network. Uh, and the bottom line here is that whatever we do or say needs to keep in mind what is good for everyone not just ourselves, our select few in the congregation. These words sort of sum up things. We will be a true community of peace if we pursue what is good for both ourselves and for all. The only way we can pull this off, the only way we can pull this off is to make Jesus Christ the center of everything. First of all, our own individual lives. And then in the church fellowship as well. Again, Bonhoeffer said, Christian community means community in and through Jesus Christ. Finally today, I want to encourage all of us to pursue community. That is being together in Jesus Christ. There's a home group today, Tony and Cheryl's house. That's a great way to experience community is in that home group. Probably going to be talking about the very things we've talked about here. That ought to be interesting. Uh, this includes also kindly admonishing those who are out of order, comforting the faint-hearted, supporting those who are weak, being patient uh, with everyone, refraining from returning evil for evil, and pursuing what is good for everyone, not just ourselves. That's how you become a community, is when everybody's doing those things. You know, and that's... That's what makes a church healthy. Uh, first of all, Jesus at the center. So if we partner with Christ in doing these things, our church fellowship will be a place of safety and peace. And it will be a place where hurting people can come and be restored uh, and be taken and ministered to with God's love. So now we have a job description. Let's go do it. Let's do it after church today. Let's do it at home group today. Let's do it in the women's Bible study. Let's do it at youth group on Wednesday night and adult Bible study. You know, let's do it in the men's breakfast. Oh, you know, there's so many places to experience community that really nobody needs to feel like they're alone uh, at all. There's opportunity everywhere for it. Uh, so let's stand together and make a commitment of our hearts uh, to community today uh, and to love people and be able to comfort and edify one another in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for this word from the Apostle Paul. It's really a, a strong word of exhortation to all of us and that you have called us to be uh, 
community, to be one with you and one with one another. We pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would anoint all of us. And I want to pray specifically about this one thing, Lord, today, that if anybody is here and they've been treated in an evil way by somebody in the church culture or, you know, that uh, even otherwise, that you would help each one of us who are in that situation to be able to step back and not return evil for evil, but to pray for those who have spitefully used us and, and turn that situation over to you. We pray, Lord, for a testimony of your grace to be at work in those situations so that we can see these people who have been acting in evil ways, in harmful ways, restored to a relationship with you and that they might be godly people. So we together ask in the name of Jesus Christ that every difficult person in our lives would repent and become godly people. And Lord, we expect to see that happening in your precious name. Amen.